If you have your sword with you this morning, please turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. That is our key text. We're going to be bouncing around and looking at a few things because today's message is a survey. Today's message is a overview. An overview of reformation and reform and what that means to you and me. We've got a reformation anniversary coming up in two days, the 500th anniversary of the beginning of the Reformation, which began October 31st, 1517, when Luther nailed his 95, well, actually his friends, nailed his 95 theses to the door of the church at Wittenberg. It was a, it was a revolution. Now, each of you and me, we are supposed to have a revolution in our hearts and in our minds and in our spirits as we get to know God and as he saves us, redeems us, purifies us, sanctifies us. You and I have reform. You and I reform. We change. We stop doing things, thinking things, believing things that are unhealthy, ungodly, and actually animosity towards God, and we stop doing that. That's Reformation. Reformation, we're going to look at a biblical and historical survey, and so I'm going to do a little bit of teaching, but as I go through this survey... Please apply every single truth, every single historical and biblical example of reformation that I give you is personal and it should be applied to me, to you, to your heart and to your mind. So with that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Blessed Heavenly Father, God of Reformation. God of reform and God of restoration. You are not just God, but you are Abba, Father. And we are so thankful, Father, today that we are your children and that that has been your plan since before the beginning of time, that we would know you and that you would know us and that your spirit, that great mystery, would live in us and you would tabernacle in us and we would become your holy of holies temple displayed for all the world to see as your example to every nation, tribe, race, language, people of the world. We thank you, Father. Thank you for this day. Thank you for these people who are here and for those who are missing. We thank you. Thank you for Martin Luther and for all of the men and women of Reformation, all of the kings and queens and judges of Reformation throughout history, all of the civil rights workers and people who stood up for what was right, Reformation, for us, Father. Each one of us has our own battles, our daily struggles, our victories. We have our relationship with you, Father, and you have told us throughout your word that you refine us as silver, that you purify us as gold, and you have called us to put off and to die to sinful nature desires and live in new life, in new hope, in a living hope, in relationship with you. And so, Heavenly Father, as we open the pages of history and the pages of your word, we ask you to open the eyes and ears of our spiritual understanding 
Speak to us, Holy Spirit of God. Reveal to us anything and everything that needs to be reformed in our minds, in our hearts, and in our lives. And in this, everybody says, Amen. You all know that Luther wasn't the only one. There were men and women before him, and after him, and today, who are reformers. People who see a wrong, people who see something, feel something, know something is wrong, and they set about to do something about it. I will not stay the same. I will not let my bad habits, my cultural bad attitudes, I will not let them stay the same. I will reform. That is God's heart for us. His heart for us is that we will not stay the same enemies of God that we were when he began to love us. Now, I wish that I, I knew what Luther knew. He was a brilliant student, and I have always been just a very fair student. He knew German, of course, his native language, and Greek, and Latin, and Hebrew, and he knew how to read and write all of them. And, and so when he went to translate the word of God into the common language of his people, which was his heart, no longer was the church to tell and command and make a law that no person but a priest was to read and interpret and translate and preach God's word. Luther saw that that wasn't right. And so reform, reform was on his heart for years and years, along with other people that I'll talk about just real briefly. Dr. Schaff said that next to the introduction of Christianity, the greatest event in history was October 31st, 1517, when Luther's brave but reckless friends nailed his thesis to the door of the Church of Wurttemberg because they were tired of hearing him rail against ungodliness. And they thought, you know, he's done all this work. We need to show people what he's done. And that wasn't the only church or the only town or the only university. There were other universities and churches and preachers, translators of the word of God in England and Bohemia and the old Czech Republic and, and uh, France and Italy. All over the world there were men and women who were crying out for reform. But he is the one who gets the most attention. The key text, not the only text by means, and not the first text to grab Luther's attention. The first text to grab Luther's attention was in the book of Romans. He was translating the book of Romans into the German language so that he could give the Sunday school teachers and the preachers of Germany a Bible lesson from the book of Romans, which he considered to be, if you had to get rid of all the books of the Bible and keep just one, it would be Romans. So when he was translating Romans, that's when it really hit him. That the righteous live by faith and not works. And works was a huge, huge stress from the church. And Luther rebelled against that. And it wasn't only the Catholic Church, it wasn't only the Roman Church, it wasn't only the Pope, it was churches around the world were pushing works for salvation. And he knew that was wrong. And then as he got into the Word, and we'll look at that, there were five verses that really, really turned his, his he just had to get active. He couldn't sit on this any longer. And he was quite happy that his friends took his theses and nailed them to the door because after they did, he couldn't stay quiet anymore. And after that, it was 30 years of warfare, spiritual, political warfare. Starting at verse 4 in Ephesians chapter 2, we read, but because of his great love for us, 
God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Verse 8. And this is, the, this is the verse after Romans that really caught his attention. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And when he read that, he thought, wait a minute, it should keep going because all of my training in the church, all of my training as an Augustinian monk, all of my training as a theologian and a scholar and a student, all of my translations from the Latin and the Hebrew and the Greek have said to me, and you need works. But there's no works here. In fact, it contradicts all of the training that he had. Faith alone saves he goes on and this faith being saved this salvation is not from yourselves in other words you can't earn it but he had been taught that that you could earn it and he he, he was thinking wait a minute lord holy spirit this is amazing. This is incredible. Everything that I've known, everything I've thought, everything I've preached and taught my people is wrong. Saved by faith alone, not of myself. It is the gift of God, verse 9, not by works, not by works, so that no one can boast for we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So it occurred to him for the first time in his life as he was studying and translating Romans and then Ephesians and then on and on, and he found more proof texts. You know, out of that long struggle that lasted more than 30 years of war between churches. This creation of this new faith-based church went against the grain of the established authority. But out of this incredible movement, out of this incredible revelation, you know how it is when you're reading your devotions in the morning or in the evening and you see an aha thing? Ah. Oh, Wow, and, and you just get excited in your own personal devotions. That's what happened to Martin. And out of that came the five solas. The five solas. Sola fide. By faith alone. Sola scriptura. By scripture alone. Sola Christus. By Christ alone. Sola gratia, by grace alone. And lastly, sola deo gloria, by and through and for God's glory alone. And he did what a lot of priests and pastors did back then who had flowing robes and colorful colors and 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 hats and robes and and belts and sashes and decorations he threw them away and he put back on those humble monkish robes that he had worn years before before all the works had rewarded him and he realized you know he was a fighting monk he he was a he knew how to fight he wasn't a knight's templar but he was a fighting monk he knew how to handle a sword. And unfortunately, because the established church authority came after him with swords, he defended himself on many occasions. Anyway, 
We are celebrating the 500th year of the Reformation, and in two days, the Pope and several members of leading world denominations, including um, uh, Pastor Colson from, no, um, oh, what's his name from the Assembly of God? Copeland, Kenneth Copeland will be there, or representing the Assemblies of God. The head of the American Baptist Church, the head of the Lutheran Church, they'll all be there and they're going to sign a document on Tuesday, officially putting an end to the war between Protestants and Catholics. And the Pope's purpose in his statement back in September, September 14th, he made a statement about ecumenical church. There will be no more Protestant church, he said. There will just be one church. And when he said that back in September, a lot of the theologians around the world went, wow, we are seeing prophecy fulfilled. We're seeing the words of Daniel's prophecies and the words from Revelation fulfilled that there will be one day a one world church. This is beginning on Tuesday. And a lot of church leaders think this is a great idea. Personally, I don't. I don't see this as a good idea at all. Ecumenicism can be very good, bringing the churches of people who truly believe together from different denominations and different churches. I think that's great. But the idea of abolishing this barrier between churches of error, no, that's not good. So, Reformation. It means the act or the process of improving something or someone by removing or correcting false problems and other stuff. So in your life and in my life, you and I have had reformation. We've corrected things. When we get sick, we take medicine. When we get married, we learn how to be a better spouse. When we have children, we learn how to parent when we join a company, we learn how to do the job they want us to do. We reform. And as you know, there have been churches that have reformed right here in Saskatchewan. There are several churches whose pastors I've talked with who have said that in their history, the denomination of their church went wrong. It went into error. And that local church separated from the denomination. It's happened in Swift Current, it's happened in Shonovan, it's happened up north. And now those churches are independent. Why? Because there was error and there had to be reform among those who loved God and his word. And as we read this morning, his word, the Logos, is true. The Reformation is called the 16th century religious movement that led to the Protestant churches beginning October 31st, 1517 at Wittenberg, Germany. Reformation is the act or the state of being reformed. Any of you have teenage children or watched your teenage grandchildren go through that reformation? I, I've watched people change from being the way they were, realizing that they were in error, and changing. I watched my own children reform. And this is the funny thing, and I've shared this with you before. I've watched them reform me. You remember that story I told you about my young, youngest Jonathan, quite young, sitting behind me, listening to me criticize someone, and then coming around in front of me, looking me in the eye and very bravely and courageously saying, Dad, you're such a self-righteous hypocrite. He wasn't but eight or nine at that time. I didn't even know he knew those words, but he knew what I was doing. I had to reform. It took me 15 minutes of arguing with myself that no, I was really right and that guy needed to be criticized because he was in error. 
But my self-righteousness, thinking that I was better than him, was evident to my son, who knew that I had to go through some reformation, so I did. And from that point on, my life has changed. I reformed. Thank God for the mouth of babes. How many of you have ever had that experience, one of your children saying something to you that just knocked your socks off? And you had to rethink your attitude, your words. That's happened to me. The 16th century religious movement marked by rejection or modification of the Roman Catholic doctrine and practice of works for salvation, of purchasing forgiveness. Luther was against that because scripture is against that because God is against that started by Martin Luther who lived in the 16th century continued by men like John Calvin the Frenchman Huldrych Zwingli the Swiss and many more after that there was a 30 years war there was 30 years of war and if you look it up in history, it's called the 30-year war. It was a war between Roman Catholic and Protestant kings, princes, dukes, duchesses, admirals, generals, princes, and ordinary priests all throughout Europe, Africa, and Asia. That 30-year war officially came to an end when a Roman Catholic prince and a Protestant prince signed a declaration of treaty saying, we don't need to be killing each other because of our religious differences anymore. And they signed a treaty called the Peace of Westphalia in 1648. Earlier reformers, Jan Hus or Jan Hus, he's a Czech, he was, he was reading all of Luther's stuff and Luther was reading all of his and Zwingli and Calvin and Tyndale and Wycliffe were all reading each other's stuff and sometimes they disagreed. Sometimes they called meetings in different churches around Germany and France and in England and down in Italy and they had big conferences where they would argue points of theology. They were doing this for a hundred years before the Reformation. John Wycliffe from England Peter Waldo, Francis of Assisi, revolutionary stuff. You remember the story of Francis when his father said, you either toe the line and you do what you're told or you're out of my will. And Francis stripped off his clothes and stood naked in front of his father and said, Father, everything that you have given me, I now return. And he became a monk who lived to love and he changed his world. And still today, we, we joke about him, we talk about him, we tell stories about having the ability to, to talk to the animals and listen to people. He was a man of grace. In the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, it says there's only one word that's translated Reformation in the New Testament, and that's in Hebrews 10, sorry, Hebrews 9, verse 10. Hebrews 9 verse 10 uses the word disposis, which means to make straight, a crooked line. It means a new order. A new order has to happen when you realize that something's wrong. You have to create a new order. You remember Jesus talking about the new law I've given you. That law was the law of love. Love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind and love your neighbor as yourself. And if you do those, those two things, you reform the world, starting with you, starting with me. It's the idea of restoring to the normally straight condition that which was crooked or bent. Diarphosis, diarphosis, make straight, create a new order. And it describes the messianic times. 
the times of the Messiah, where Jesus said, this isn't what's normal. This isn't what the Pharisees and Sadducees teach. This isn't what Jewish culture has taught throughout the thousand years that we have been rejecting my father. But here it is, love your enemy. Oh, that was revolutionary stuff because the Jews had been taught to hate their enemies. And Jesus said, a new law, a reformation, I give you. Don't hate. Love, 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 only love. Now, I told you Luther had five texts that really just rocked his world and blew his mind. And the first one was, like I said, from Romans, Romans 1, 17, that says, The righteous will live by faith. And he started to do what no other theologian in all of history had ever done. He started creating a concordance. He linked Romans 1.17 with Ephesians 2 and with Hebrews 10. And he started looking at all of the faith verses. And 1 Peter 2 and 2 Timothy 3. And let's look at 1 Peter 2. The second verse that rocked his world was Ephesians 2 verse 8. The third verse that rocked his world was 1 Peter 2, 5. You also, living like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And Luther said, wait a minute, I am a priest but God's word says that every believer is a priest. And this just rocked his world because that meant that the church didn't have the authority anymore. It meant that you and I, ordinary people who know Jesus, who believe in God, who live by faith, are priests. Oh, this was revolutionary stuff. You're talking to a man who thought that he had authority. And he realized by reading the Logos of God, the Word, the truth of God, that you and I have the authority of God Almighty as a priest and as a priestess, holy, chosen by God before time. In 2 Timothy 3.16, then further rocked his world when it said, All Scripture is God-breathed. All Scripture is inspired by the Holy Spirit and is useful. All, all Scripture, the historical books, the poetical books, the prophetical books, those books that we don't like to read because they say unto and unto and unto and unto and unto and unto. They are all, God's Word says, all inspired by God and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness and thus his sola scriptura through God's word alone. No longer in Luther's mind would human tradition have any sway but to educate Poetry and philosophy and history are still wonderful, but they don't trump God's word. And he realized this for the first time that the church traditions and that the papal decrees do not overpower God's word. Oh, this was just I can't even imagine. I, maybe you can. Maybe you have a really good imagination and you can think, what was he feeling right then? Change and change can be scary. Yes, how many of you have decided in your life, maybe as a child or as a teenager or as a young uh, married person, or going into your first career or your first uh, job, or when you decided to retire, fear of the change? Oh, things are going to get different. I was so blessed when I was in the home 
of uh, one of our people here and I was trying to help in the kitchen and the wife who has the gift of hospitality was doing everything and I couldn't get in there. I couldn't get in there. She was doing it. She had done it all of her life. And he knew his place. He helped in every way he could, but he didn't change her. He didn't even try. He loves her. She loves him. They do what they do. And if they decided to change that, and all of a sudden he started to do all the cooking and canning and sorting, I guarantee you he would be scared to death. Because she does it. And she does it very well, and he also does everything very well. To change would be scary. How many of you were scared when you decided to retire and didn't know if you'd be bored or not? I've talked to so many retirees, that's their number one scare. Am I going to be bored? Let's move on. His fifth verse that rocked his world was Matthew 11, 29 to 30. Matthew 11, 29 to 30 says, Jesus said to his disciples when they were scared because he kept telling them that he was going to have to die and then in three days he was going to raise again and they didn't understand because they hadn't been given the Holy Spirit and they didn't understand and they were scared. And he kept saying, I have to leave you and they were scared. And he kept saying, I, I am the Messiah, but I'm not the Messiah you were hoping for. I'm not a conquering general that's going to kick the Romans out. I'm not that kind of God. And they were scared. And he turned around as they were walking one day and he said to them in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, take my yoke upon you. You take my yoke. You know that thing that binds me to my father? Take it. Take my yoke and, and learn from me because I listen to my father and I do whatever he says. Listen, learn from me. Do the same thing I do. For I am gentle and I'm humble and you will find rest. Don't worry anymore. Don't be anxious. Don't be afraid. I'm going to give you rest. All you have to do is give me your burdens. Give me your fears. Give me what's bothering you and I will give you rest. I am rest. Take my yoke, for it's easy. And my burden, the thing that burdens me, Jesus said to his disciples, is light. Why is it light? Because it's already finished. On the cross, he said it. But before time began, he decided to do it. He would take our problems. He would reform us. We wouldn't even have to reform ourselves, except with study and work and change and repentance. So, in the scriptures, and I won't go through them all, there are 64 verses that talk about the idea of reformation. For instance, 1 Samuel 7, 3 says, return to the Lord. That's reform. Because the Israelites, just like you and me, maybe, I'm speaking for myself, really, but I know the history of humankind has always gone away from God. He'll bless us, and then we forget about him. And then we call out for help, and he saves us. And then he blesses us, and then we forget about him. And we call out for help, and he hears us. And just the cycle has been going on since Adam and Eve. And Israel, being the chosen people of God, were the most stubborn, block-headed, stubborn, stiff-necked people in the world. So he chose them. He chose them. And they always rejected him. Always. Blessing, rejection, saving. Blessing, rejection, saving. Over and over again. And Samuel said, return to the Lord and put away the foreign gods. Put away the idols. Put away those things that you worship and return to the Lord. Joshua 
Abraham, Moses, Paul, the kings of Israel and Judah, some of them were great reformers, and we'll talk just a little bit about them too. You know, one of our favorite verses of reform, one of the 64 is 2 Chronicles 7.14. Some of you can say it by heart. And if my people, who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear and I will forgive and I will heal. But it takes reform. It takes reformation. It takes rejecting sin and sinfulness and our sinful nature and choosing to return to God. And there are many, many more. There's only one time in the Old Testament, in the Septuagint, in the Latin, that the word is translated reform. Only one time in the New Testament, reformation. Only one time in the Old Testament, reform. And that's in Leviticus 26, 23. And it's in the negative. It's Moses saying to those stiff-necked, hard-hearted, block-headed Jews or Israelites back at that time, you'll never change. He was so frustrated. And you remember those times that God said to Moses, Moses, these rebellious, stiff-necked, complaining Jews, Israelites are driving me nuts. I'm going to destroy them. And Moses would say, Lord, please don't. Please don't. And, he got, and the scripture says God changed his mind three times. But he kept saying to the people, you're never going to change. You stiff-necked, stubborn, unbelieving, disobedient blockheads. The New Testament corresponding synonym is the word moronos. You morons, stop rebelling. And he says, he says in, in 2 Chronicles 7.14, do it and I'll bless you. And then in Leviticus 26, 23, you're not doing it. To let oneself be chastened, to let oneself be instructed. How many of you really struggle with that? Somebody comes up to you and says, I saw what you did, I heard what you said, and you really should do something else. What happens to the, to the hair on the back of your back and neck and your, your ridge line and your backbone and your stubbornness? What happens when somebody says, I have a correction for you? What happened to you when you were younger and somebody says, that was wrong. You need to reform. I remember. I did not like being corrected. So when Moses, when God says to Moses, who says to the children of Israel in Leviticus 26, 23, you're not being reformed. So they were Normal, just like you and me. It's hard to change sometimes without the grace of God. It's hard to be chastised. Sometimes it's hard for us to correct our children sometimes, isn't it? I remember my sister Bonnie saying to her daughters, Charlotte and Amy, my two nieces who now live just north of Seattle, do what I say, don't do what I do. And she was completely serious. And she had just had a very personal one-on-one -on -one talk with my mom who said, your lifestyle is crazy. You're killing yourself. Alcohol, cigarettes, illicit affairs. She was driving my nieces crazy. New man in the house every day. Just insane lifestyle. My mom said, you've got to stop. You're offending God. You are threatening your children. You are hurting yourself. And I'm ashamed. She took that information and turned around and said to Charlotte and Amy, do what I say. In other words, Charlotte was so, or Bonnie was so entwined in her sinful behavior and her attitude and her lifestyle that she didn't think that she could change. So she warned her daughters to listen to the truth don't watch me. And that was huge. 
I was just talking to one of my nieces a couple of weeks ago about that incident. And I remember it. I remember standing there. And as a young man, thinking, wow, that's not going to work. I don't know if you've ever done that before. After my son rebuked me for my self-righteousness and for criticizing that other person, I, I tried to justify myself and it didn't work. Now, there are many biblical reformers, you guys, and because this is a survey, I'm just gonna mention them. We're not gonna look at them too seriously. There was Asa, who was called Azariah. Second Chronicles 15, he was a reformer. The Spirit of God came upon him. And oh, did he do some reforming. It lasted exactly as long as he did. And then when he died, the next king, his son, did evil in the sight of the Lord. That's how fickle we are, how flippant we are. And then there was Jeremiah. You remember the weeping prophet. God would tell him to go do something as an example and show the children of Israel how forgiving he was and how loving God was. And, and uh, he would tell him to, you know, wear a funny belt, go, go break a pot, you know, do this and that, you know, go live in a hole in the ground. And Jeremiah used to just plead with God, just like Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane. God, if there's any way, please don't make me do that. You know what's going to happen. They're just going to mock me. And they would. But he was obedient. Jeremiah. And then there was Josiah. How many of you know somebody who named their child Josiah because of the meaning of their name and their life? Josiah. He reigned for 30 years, a thousand years before Christ. He fought 54 pitched battles. That's two wars a year. But Josiah, who became a king when he was just a boy, loved God. And he missed God. And he was surrounded because of his fathers, because of the kings before him, because of his evil father. He was surrounded by idolatry. They had had the gall to put idols in the temple. They were everywhere. They were on the top of every hill throughout Israel and Judah. And Josiah, he was grieved. He fought and he reformed for 30 years. And then, well, 32 years, sorry. And then, way, way later, 2,000 years later, after Josiah was Alfred the Great of Wessex, England. He was a godly man, he was a student a theologian, a pastor, a prince, and a king. And Alfred loved God. And he made it his, his goal and his purpose in his reign, which was 30 years, just two years shy of Josiah's reign. He was dedicated to Christ, and he was the very first king of England to translate the Bible into the common English tongue. And I don't know if any of you have ever read Old English from the 16th century. It's quite a bit different than ours, but you can almost make it out. It's, it's hard. But if you read Old English from the 16th century or from the 14th century, 15th century, from the 10th century, it was just beginning. You know, English is really just a combination of German and French and Gaelic and all sorts of languages thrown together. But Alfred the Great, you guys, this is not, uh, uh, this is not, um, I'm not saying this because I want you to tithe more, but Alfred donated every cent of his personal income to the church, to building Christian schools, to building churches every penny of his personal income because after all he was a king so he had everything he needed he had food every day he had clothes he had an army he had a navy he was the first king in england in fact he's called the father of the english navy in the 10th century he knew the importance of guarding his shoreline from the danish vikings who had attacked him dozens of times 
He believed in biblical law, starting with the Ten Commandments. He had the children recite the Ten Commandments in every school. He believed in the law of the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. He taught that throughout his kingdom of Wessex. And then there were guys like John Wycliffe in the 14th century. And, John, and William Tyndale of the 15th century. They were both Oxford Cambridge graduates. They were students. They were priests. They were pastors. They were amazing. They could translate from the Greek and Latin and Hebrew into English. John Wycliffe and William Tyndale. Tyndale, of course, was, uh, was called a heretic by his king and burned at the stake. And while he was burning, he shouted out so that many people witnessed it and wrote it down for history. May the prince, may the prince know God's word. Two years later, Henry VIII, and you all have heard stories about Henry VIII. He was that guy who, if he didn't like one wife, he would have her beheaded and marry someone new, didn't like her, got her, you know, that they had a girl and not a boy, up on the head. And Henry VIII was an amazing despot, a, a terrible husband, an awful king. But, but, Henry VIII, two years after Tyndale's death, ordered that every church in England have a copy of the English Bible as much as been translated in every single church. And of course, that's in the 16th century English, which is still old English. But he commanded it. Here's this guy who could easily divorce and kill a wife because they didn't please him, but Tyndale's prayer to God as he was burning. Let my prince hear your word. And later he commanded that every single church in England had a copy of the Bible available to every parishioner who could read. Amazing. That is what we would call a God thing. So, in conclusion, <laughs> Ephesians 2, verse 8. In celebration of Reformation Day in two days, we read, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this salvation is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. And God has given you and me that gift so that we would reform so that you and I would repent of our sinful ways and change. That's reformation. So as we go through the next couple of days and you'll, you'll keep hearing things on the news about the celebrations around the world and, and uh, that great meeting of all the heads of the churches of the world in Rome where they sign a, a, a peace treaty on Tuesday. Be praying, be praying for us, pray for our church, pray for our country, that we will change. To be like what? To be like Jesus. Change to be like Jesus. Amen? Thanks, you guys.